Um, well, good afternoon and welcome to the first guest lecture in the fall 2022 term for Statistics 447, uh, Data uh, Science Programming Methods. We're very happy and glad to have Zilat Pavka with us today. Um, just as a really brief introduction, Zilat is a recovering physicist who has been in the field of data science, arguably before it had that name, and has very deep experience in assessing and using methods, and particularly in comparing them, and uh, has a pretty compelling and unique way of presenting about this, which I thought would be of interest to all. I'll keep it brief. We have a little bit about Zilat and further links on the guest lecture webpage. And I think with that, I can just hand it over and uh, add another big thank you for uh, making time and uh, talking to us uh, remotely as one can do these days. Uh, it has its upsides. And with that, Zilat, uh, on to you. Sean, thank you. And thank you for having me. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, I started in physics and uh, I've been also uh in finance for a brief period of time and then uh, i moved to what's now called data science and machine learning and i'm probably known by some since i am um, in uh, organizing meetups and uh today i will talk mostly about uh gradient boosting machines which is a machine learning algorithm but i will also maybe give a few career tips since uh, many of your students will become data scientists. So maybe I can uh, give them a few tips. And then of course the disclaimer, nothing I say here is related to my employer. And uh, I will start with this slide that started appearing uh, about 10 years ago, when uh, this hype about deep learning uh, started. So before that, big data was a big hype that was kind of winding down. So the must have been, the, there had to be a new hype and then uh, deep learning was the new hype. And uh, with these kind of claims that uh, deep learning beats every other machine learning algorithm uh, if you have enough data. And of course, this was because in vision, in computer vision, deep learning was very successful. And indeed, uh, uh, if you do deep learn, if you do computer vision, then deep learning was really a game changer and had uh, amazing results. Also combined with reinforcement learning, there have been very great results in kind of virtual environments like games where you could uh, generate uh, as much data as you wanted. And uh, some success also in uh, natural language processing. But uh, we've been promised uh, uh, self-driving cars, the deep learning will We'll solve that. And also some people were thinking about like general artificial intelligence arriving very soon. But I think we are pretty far away from the latter, but it seems more and more that clear that even self-driving cars is uh, kind of always like two more years or three more years until we get them. Meanwhile, we have had um, traditional machine learning for many, many decades. So KDD is uh, and used to be from the very beginning, one of the biggest conferences on traditional machine learning tools starting from the 90s. And uh, machine learning had uh, great success in many of this traditional domain like fraud detection, credit scoring, uh, marketing analytics, manufacturing, insurance, telecoms, all these uh, traditional applications of machine learning. And 
Machine learning was mostly used in these domains in which we had uh, so-called tabular data, data that uh, it's in rows and columns, observations and various variables, and uh, they have numerical or categorical values, and usually they are stored in uh, relational databases. And uh, a while ago, I've been asking myself, uh, can deep learning beat these algorithms as it was pro promised uh, in these traditional setups? And I tried on several data sets at work and also on a public data set. And I published these uh, in this GitHub repository. I had uh, discussions with some of the best people in the field, some of them who uh, were not only experts in uh, and developed some of the more traditional implementations of, uh, or some of the implementations of the more traditional algorithms like random forest or gradient boosting, but also uh, of deep learning in various open source packages. And uh, the feeling at that time was that somehow uh, trees and ensemble of trees like random forests and gradient boosting uh, are better at dealing with uh, uh, fitting to this kind of tabular, special categorical type of data. And then a bit later, Tiang Chen came at this meetup that I've been organizing at the time in Los Angeles. And he gave a talk. Uh, he is uh, the main author of XGBoost, one of the most popular open source gradient boosting machines, but also the author of MXNet, which uh, was a initially a popular uh, deep learning uh, implementation. So he knows both sides, the traditional and the deep learning side. And he looked at Kaggle's, how they were won in the previous year. And he said that about two thirds of Kaggle's were won using uh, um, gradient boosting machines and the other third uh, using deep learning. The split was kind of like, those problems that had tabular data were typically won by gradient boosting machines and the ones that had images, computer vision, those or text that were uh, where deep learning was uh, more successful. So my interpretation of this or my version of this slide is that uh, actually probably if you have, if you work in a business and you have all this boring tabular data that makes money to your business, then uh, uh, try gradient boosting machines because it's likely it will perform better than deep learning. And uh, this was also recognized later by many others like uh, Kaggle or uh, some of the uh, Word best Kaglers. Um, and also re more recently, I did several surveys on Twitter, LinkedIn. Of course, here is not that representative because most people following me will have a bias towards gradient boosting, but it seems like many people think that gradient boosting are better for tabular data than deep learning. Also, if you look at Kaggle has this yearly surveys and I won here like a five-year bet uh, made in 2015, it seems like even in 2020 and the same in 2022, uh, more people are still using uh, gradient boosting random forest decision trees in general for machine learning because a lot of people are still working with the tabular data sets. And this should not be super surprising. So uh, there are these uh, papers from overlapping authors from 2006, which are still pretty relevant. They're old, but they're still pretty relevant. Uh, they looked at many data sets, many algorithms, and 
and like random forest, gradient boosting, and neural nets came up at the top. And of course, deep learning is basically a, um, a neural net, uh, just uh, uh, a little bit more complicated. Uh, and so it's not a surprise that uh, these three are kind of the best. And with larger data, actually, gradient boosting will be trend of forest. And uh, on, uh, but on most tabular data, it will be actually the best. So I've been using GBS and random forest exactly since 2006. I didn't know about these papers, but it somehow happened that uh, that's when I started using them. Um, so in the last few years, there had been many attempts to specialize deep learning for tabular data. And there have been uh, many suggestions how to adapt, uh, how to expand deep learning and uh, make it uh, better and more competitive with uh, gradient boosting for tabular data. So this happened in over the last, let's say five years. And uh, there are all these methods, and there is a paper that came out this year in February that compared all these methods to gradient boosting and random forest. And uh, on a few data sets, and apparently gradient boosting beats actually all of these uh, methods, no matter how much the authors put uh, effort into creating the specialized deep learning methods that uh, uh, would beat gradient boosting and random forest uh, uh, on tabular data. So all these methods have been basically already tweaked for tabular data, and they're still underperforming, uh, like HGBoost or CatBoost or even random forest. So besides uh, having a good algorithm, there are many other things that you need to have good predictions. One of the most mundane is that you need to clean your data. Uh, also, you need uh, to feature engineer your data in most cases. Like the deep learning advocates, they always come up with a, a showing that for computer vision, you don't need to feature engineer. Deep learning is figuring out that by itself, but for tabular data, it doesn't. So deep learning cannot figure out if you have a column that says, I don't know, um, let's say it has Thanksgiving as a one hot encoded variable, and that if that's predicting sales or not. So it's not going to generate that feature by itself from no other information. To get good results, you also have to do hyperparameter tuning. And even better results, you need to ensemble different models. That's what is uh, winning the Kanga competitions, where like a um, very minor increase in accuracy can uh, make you win the competition. But ultimately, what you need to do, you need to do this date, what used to be called data mining process. So I, I draw this process showing what you need to do in a data science machine learning project. But I based it on the Chris DM documents from 1999. So just quickly, you need to collect, obviously, the data, explore it, clean it. And then you can do modeling. You need to validate the models. And then you can deploy. And from every step, you might, it's kind of very iterative, researchy, that in every step, you might need to go back a few steps. Let's say if your modeling doesn't good, provide good results, maybe you need to do more exploration, more cleaning of the data, and so forth, and repeat. So ultimately, your goal is to work in a company and you have to please your boss, which makes 
means make more money for the company and uh, the company doesn't really care what kind of tools you are using. So use the tools that provide the best results. So, and uh, I think that's why it's great to, to see, uh, to be in a program like the one you are attending that you can see the, the best tools for the job and not the ones that uh, are hyped by blog posts. And the same applies with the methods. So what are GBMs? Quickly, uh, GBMs are based on trees, decision trees, and decision trees are basically random, are um, iterative partitioning of the space. Uh, so a decision tree will look like something like this. So if you try to predict, you have some data, let's say emails, and then you try to predict if it's spam or genuine email, you might have uh, various variables. And then the decision tree is you build from the data, the structure itself and the split points. And then for uh, in each in each uh, node, you will split by a given variable if it's smaller or greater than some value for numerical variables. And then in the leaves, you will have predictions. So this is a decision tree. This is a very old concept in machine learning. And then the boosting will uh, build iteratively several decision trees uh, and um, kind of the general idea one of the four first boosting algorithms was Adaboost in which um, you build iteratively with trees and every tree is trying to uh, correct the errors made by the average of the previous trees and at the end you will average all the trees and Gradient boosting is just taking this uh, a little bit further. I'm not gonna, you don't need to understand the rest of the uh, lecture. Um, you don't need, to, we don't need to go into the math details. So I provide, this is my favorite book on machine learning. So if you want more details, you can check it out. So let's see now if, we want to use gradient boosting that what kind of software we uh, should use. Uh, and I was asking myself what kind of software I can use for my own projects where I had uh, some fair amount of data. And uh, I wanted the software to be open source. And not only because it's free, but also because open source software tend to have great communities, like there are meetups, there are conferences, there are lots of things on YouTube, like this will go on YouTube. If I was someone from like a very expensive commercial software, then probably this would not go on YouTube. Uh, there is Stack Overflow, uh, there is, uh, <clears throat> lots of books and documentation actually i think open source in machine learning at the moment is uh not only free but actually better quality than uh, the commercial software or implementations and we are talking about r or python and uh i did some work on benchmarking several open source implementations because I wanted to see what works on uh, my data. So I tried some of the basic passages and they, they couldn't cope with my amount of data. So even though the data I had, it was just millions of observations. So some of the basic packages died at around uh, 100,000 observations. So I have in this, uh, benchmark on GitHub, scalability graphs. Uh, the gist of it is that the two best at the moment, uh, at that moment, were XGBoost and H2O. 
that was 2015 and then two more came a bit later uh light gbm and cat boost and i think these are the top four um open source uh implementations of gradient boosting machines some people will ask but what about big data uh none of these can uh, deal with billions of trillions of uh, data points or terabytes or petabytes of data well fortunately most of us don't have uh, petabytes of data so there are clear surveys that uh, most people have at most tens of millions or maybe 100 million records and that's how we do machine learning on it and also if you have a lot more data it's usually some kind of raw data like for example clicks but you don't want to have uh, analytics on your clicks you usually want to have analytics on let's say your users and then you create these uh, refined reduced data sets where you do feature engineering and from uh, maybe billions of clicks you are down to millions of users or 10 millions of users if you are lucky enough to have 10 millions of users. Uh, so the cure for this kind of uh, uh, more data is actually more RAM in one server. You don't need to have distributed computing. And um, I put out these numbers like in 2015 like uh you could even easily have access to amazon uh cloud for example or the other cloud providers and have like 250 gigabytes of ram in uh one server and that was already enough for uh even 100 million observations so over the years this has increased and now we have really outrageous and i checked out yesterday uh, now you can have a server with tw 24 terabytes uh, of memory in uh, one server. Meanwhile, most people don't really need anything remotely close to this. So most people uh, use servers for machine learning or desktops or laptops that are maybe 100 gigs or a few hundred gigs of memory. So what we want is not distributed computing for machine learning, what we actually want uh, faster machine learning. And uh, we want faster because we need to, to, to get very good results. We need to run many, many models. So maybe thousands of models. So we do cross validation. That's already means probably like five, six times uh six training runs for every model or parameter setup we do hyperparameter tuning probably hundreds of parameter values or combinations uh, and then maybe we even do ensembles of tens or maybe hundreds of models so we want all this to to run in maybe a few hours a few days uh we want fast machine learning we cannot spend uh uh days with training one machine learning model so i streamlined a little bit later this benchmark into uh one looking only at gradient boosting machines and only the best algorithms uh i selected those based on uh what i talked to friends they are using and also like a larger survey so the top three are xgboost like gbbm h2o and then uh, a bit later, Cat Boost became also popular. Um, so these benchmarks are about speed and ac accuracy. I don't claim any um, any results that one algo is better than the other because this is just on one data set. But but uh, what's representative for sure is the speed of computation and uh, if you have cpu then uh, xgboost and lightgbm are the two fastest 
and all of these uh, libraries they have implement GPU implementations which are actually completely different code base so they can be considered as different products but if you have a GPU you can use uh, any of these and XGBoost is the most mature and uh, fastest also. Um, I lo looked at RAM usage. This was a problem when I started the project in 2015, like some of the old, let's say random forest R package uh, was running out of RAM even if you had, at the time, maybe you had a few tens of gigs of RAM and it was running out uh, uh, even with 100,000 observations. Uh, but as you can see here, 100 million records, even on relatively small RAM, even basically nowadays, even on a laptop, you can do 100 million records, machine learning with 100 million records. Uh, on a laptop. Uh, the same uh, applies for GPU. Now, the, if you have in a desktop or a server GPU, it, will, it can fit all these hundreds of millions of records in the memory because they are stored in a very efficient way. So, XGBoost or LiveDBM, but also if you care about uh, deploying things in production, then H2O has some advantages. So it's very easy to create uh, real-time well, web-based uh, service that uh, can score uh, using uh, HTTP or HTTPS requests. And this is all you need to do, actually. So H2 includes... Um, this tool that you can uh, build, build a job file and then uh, run scoring, a scoring service that's very fast. It's uh, a few milliseconds even for large models. So also if you want to get into gradient boosting machines, uh, coding, meaning training uh, on some data gradient boosting machine in any of these libraries is usually like a few lines of code. So very easy. Uh, sometimes you need to transform the data in this kind of specialized uh, uh, matrix models that they like so that the training is more efficient. And then it's training is just one line of code essentially. It's a longer line of code where you can provide these parameters. Uh, some of the main ones are the number of trees, obviously, as I was saying that you build trees iteratively, then the depths of the trees. And then there is also like some kind of regularization where, uh, or you can call it a learning rate where you average the trees, but there is some uh, kind of uh, factor that's used to dampen the um, predictions of older trees. Once you have this model, it's let's say in R or Python is stored in an object and then predicting, making prediction is another line of code. So crazy. So the API in both R and Python is very nice. Uh, you don't need to write a lot of code. Uh, parameters, there are lots of knobs you can tune, but the main ones are like uh, the number of trees, as I said, the depths of the trees and the learning rate. And uh, these, these are the, all the parameters that H2 had and then uh, uh, you can also do early stopping, which means that the algorithm will uh, look at the accuracy during training on a separate holdout set. And if that starts to decrease, then it will stop. Then you don't need to provide a number of trees. So there are various uh, tutorials about how to tune GBMs. 
So it's a little bit more involved. So I just provide these for reference. And then here is a quick comparison of what I was saying that uh, if you don't have a GPU and you need uh, fast training, then you probably want to use XGBoost or LiGBM. If you have a GPU and you want fast training, then uh, use XGBoost. That's the most mature and the most stable. Uh, however, if what you care is easy deployment and you want like fast real-time scoring, then you might want to use H2O. So the trick is that uh, if you have tabular data and you want to win a data science competition or the Kaggle, kind of the typical pass is that you need to explore the data and do some feature engineering, uh, probably clean the data. Uh, then you would want to train a few gradient boosting models using XGBoost or like GBM. Uh, a few others maybe like random forest. And uh, here's for example, in this competition, uh, what were the results, the accuracy or AUC in this case uh, of different models. You can see that XGBoost and LiGBM had very good accuracy and then uh, logistic regression and uh, neural networks was a bit behind, but you don't need to throw away uh, even the neural networks. You can use it uh, in an ensemble combining uh, all these models into an ensemble. And uh, this was actually from a blog post and the source is at the bottom with like gray, how to win a uh, uh, competition. And I think this is kind of the pretty standard in uh, what would you do if you want uh, a very accurate, good model. So if you have tabular data, then uh, GBM use you must. Uh, I have uh, a lot more uh, information on uh, these uh, in these GitHub repositories. So there is that original one, the benchmark ML, which I benchmark not only gradient boosting at the time, but also random forest, uh, some of the linear models and also neural nets. And then uh, the other project, the GBM perf has just the gradient boosting machines and that's a bit more streamlined and also made more reproducible. So it has a Docker file, so you can easily produce uh, the results yourself. And then there is also this other repository like GBM intro has some uh, introduction to GBM code that you might want to steal and use it for yourself, for your project. So I think that would be about GBMs. And now I can uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the job of a data scientist. And uh, this will be more like soft skills. So uh, I get in trouble with this slide. I was invited uh, once at UCLA to talk to kind of like career days. And I, I, I came up with this slide and then they never invited me anymore. But I strongly believe that, yes, indeed, uh, to be successful, you need uh, hard work and talent, but there is also quite a bit of uh, luck element to it. But, but sure, you, if you put hard work, then uh, you, it, it will increase your chances in uh, becoming successful in uh, data science as in many other uh, areas as well. So one thing that uh, it's maybe not obvious, but uh, 
uh, I think it's important is to develop connections. You can do that already starting during uh, your studies, connect to people. That's how you would find out about the best jobs and more jobs. And uh, connections will be very useful later on in your career. Um, to connect, one of the best ways uh, to connect is uh, there are tons of meetups. Uh, there are many data science meetups, machine learning meetups, like R Python meetups. Uh, you can uh, go in your city again and uh, attend these meetups. And it's not only about going and learning new things uh, from uh, a talk, but it's more about meeting other people and uh, making connections. So uh, I happened to uh, start a meetup myself in 2009 in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, I met a lot of people uh, during those meetups and many of my friends told me that they met other people and they also, that's how they found a new job. They talked to other people and they found out that some company is hiring and some person was, happened to be there at the meetup. And then uh, that was the kind of the first contact. So I'm an introvert and probably many of you in this field are also introverts. So for us, it's kind of hard to do all this networking and going to the meetups, but I think it is very use useful. So you have to get over this somehow and then uh, try to, to build uh, connections. Uh, here's a picture of one of the meetups I've been running, the R meetup. And connections means in person, but also online. I use LinkedIn a lot, especially when I go to meetups or conferences, then uh, I add those people uh, to my connections on LinkedIn. And I think Facebook is kind of useless for career or uh, uh, networking. So, uh, Use, use LinkedIn for that. Also, I think it's very useful, especially if you are like a student to show that you already done a few real uh, world kind of projects. So um, try to create a portfolio of projects, even if it's just like two, three, four projects, uh, try to write like a blog post. And it's very easy to publish something uh, that then you can send it to a recruiter, a link about that. And it could be, I'm sure you have hobbies, interests, you can just grab some kind of data set that it's related to that and then do some kind of analysis. Uh, visualizations look good and it usually helps. Uh, and then you can, try a few machine learning uh, algorithms on the data and uh, describe uh, your little project and make it like a blog post, something that you can, and a few of those you can create a portfolio and then you can uh, send those to potential recruiters. Uh, so here's one I used to teach uh, at UCLA and then a university in uh, Europe. And uh, uh, I asked my students to, so the final project, they had to publish it on GitHub uh, and they had to write a little report. So you can actually even uh, use those projects that you did uh, for, for some class, just have it somewhere on the public internet. Uh, also to kind of close, 
Uh, this is Peter Norvig. He uh, is old school guy from Google. So this blog post is probably from like 15 years ago and not related to data science, but rather to learning programming. So this blog post is a rant about all these books that promise you to teach you programming in a month, in a week, or maybe even a day. And then uh, what he says that actually you should take more time learning anything, programming, for example, or I adapted this to data science. Don't try to rush and try to learn uh, something in uh, a month or two. And uh, you're not going to become a data scientist in a month or two. So uh, uh, it will require you to invest way more time into this. And uh, of course, it's this program you are doing, and then uh, maybe an internship or the first job. And uh, uh, you will. Even after like 10 or 15 or 20 years of experience, you will be always learning something new. So don't rush. Uh, just try, trying to learn something and uh, becoming an expert in a very short amount of time. So all right, I guess uh, that's pretty much it. And I, I wanted to leave uh, some time for questions. So I guess we can... Uh, do that now. Perfect. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, the one thing, and that didn't occur to me until you started today with those timelines, was that a few things changed just in the last year. Um, I finally given in and started listening a little bit to podcasts, some sort of on this boundary there. And one of the ones that I follow, uh, run by a journalist with a sufficient knack for technology, put particular focus on this breakthrough of language models and really, really deep learning, the stuff that we're now having coming from everywhere, you know, over on the code side where you can pay your $10 a month in Google Copilot and just put your one line of comment in and you got your, you know, standard little algorithm piece put in and or, um, the, the writing completion, the stuff that started by just finishing a sentence, um, went to finishing a paragraph and by now can spew out three paragraphs. I think the big takeaway here really is that for somewhat structured data, the tabular data, we milk its advantage. But do you ever feel that maybe the other stuff will be catching up to us eventually because it's so insane for some of these large, 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 large models. I mean, it used to be 5 billion parameters and then 50 mm. and then 150 billion parameters. I mean, it's just, it's insane. And they seem to be getting the prediction stuff right too because the training happens in what is essentially compute centers or several clusters of compute centers and you get prediction models that are small enough to fit into our phones. So, you know, do you think, I mean, it's hard to look forward. There will be a turn in the road where this may change or not, because fundamentally we're doing statistics on models with formulas. So the the you know trees and partitions will will just continue to have an edge on that type of data. Yeah, it, I mean, it might. I'm actually I don't have a horse in this race, uh, truly speaking. So when I when I started this benchmarks, I I. I I didn't care if like uh, neural nets will beat uh, GBMs and those. I just wanted to pick the best uh, for uh, my use case. So uh, yeah, at some point, uh, like deep learning or neural nets or maybe some completely other algorithms might catch up and might exceed uh, the predictions we're able to do with GBMs. Though in many of these use cases is actually so uh, the data sets are are not big and they are not we cannot really increase them like for example in the in games and virtual environments you can create as much data as you want and uh, for example deep learning learned uh, uh, and beat all previous algorithms on let's say playing video games right so 
they could just generate as much footage as they wanted. And uh, then the algorithm could use uh, more and more data and uh, learn that. However, in like, I don't know, in uh, economics or many of these businesses or companies, we, we have uh, in some use cases, let's say medical, Research, sometimes you have data sets of 100 observations or 1,000 observations, and you cannot really create billions of data points. Uh, and in, in, in that case, this uh, extra compute, I'm not sure if it's really, or, or large models with millions or billions of parameters is not necessarily an uh, advantage. Uh, so I, I I guess it depends. Yeah, it in some cases it might, in uh, some other cases uh, it will probably not. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fair too that the the amount of data is definitely an input. Um, you can train some of these large language models on the web at large and billions of documents, but. Some turns that happened are truly surprising. I mean, just to close up on that, that, you know, after Dell E, we're now at the point where the current frontier is actually not to just create a new picture, but animated sequences. So there might be movies soon done by AI. So it's, uh, it's, it's yeah. interesting. But anyway, that takes us a little bit away from, from this because, yes, uh, you made all the right uh, pledges and, and, and connections. They are open source tools, measurable, inspectable, comparable. So it's, it's, it's good. This is actually stuff that we still have control over. But I don't want to monopolize this. If anybody else has questions, I don't see anything this up in the chat. Just uh, unmute and, and uh, say hi and ask if there, if there is anything. Um, hi, Dr. Pafka. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, I was just really curious. So you mentioned that there were some extensions to deep learning um, for GBMs. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about like why those extensions weren't able to be successful in, in beating a regular GBM or some work that still has to be done to improve that? Yeah, I, I don't think anyone knows, <laughs> even not the authors. So there are, we don't actually we don't even know why GBMs are so successful in uh, uh, predicting tabular data. We just kind of like uh, we have guesses. For example, uh, well, I, I showed briefly this size, this slide. This is Arno Kandel, who is. Um, who has developed both the GBM implementation and the deep learning implementation for H2O. So he has much more in-depth knowledge about how these algorithms work uh, than me. And then he says that uh, he, he just kind of has a uh, feeling that uh, by cutting the space, especially with this categorical so that you have this combination of categorical values that somehow you can uh, fit better the data with like decision trees and ensembles of the decision trees rather than neural nets, which are like uh, more like, cont you would think that cont for more like for continuous variables, but actually it's more like speculation. So we don't really know. So fast forward to these methods. Uh, they they all try some tricks from like deep learning and then uh, uh, some other things like attention and uh, these kind of things. But but so it's so these haven't been developed like in a principal way or even GBMs or actually the whole machine learning is not developed in a principal way. It's not. It's not like physics that uh, we, we we try to develop a model that kind of explains how things work. We just, it's more like engineering that we, we come up or even not engineering is, I don't know, a lot of random guessing or we, 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 we don't even design these machine learning models based on uh, that we look at the data and then based on how the data is structured, we design some machine learning model. We just 
come up with a machine learning model, and then we see how good it is. And we have no idea how good it's going to be on different types of data. So uh, I, th I think there, there, there are a few guidelines, like, for example, if you have very little data, let's say 100 observations, so typically in this kind of medical research, then uh, you want a model that doesn't have a lot of parameters. So uh, very often, like a very simple model, like a logistical regression with a few parameters will, will beat like neural nets or even GBMs uh, because everything else will overfit because it has too many parameters. But other than a few of this kind of guidelines, general guidelines, we don't really design these uh, modifications based on uh, on how uh, the data looks. And then we're trying to incorporate that. And we use that in the design of the algorithm in a principled way. So it's kind of, we come up with something, see if it works, then we tweak it a little bit and see if that works. Uh, and uh, so, so I, I think I think nobody knows. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, in this way, unfortunately, yeah, machine learning is not really a science, like in the pure way. You keep mentioning the notion of parameters. And yeah. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the evaluation performance or prediction performance of these methods, right? So my understanding is deep learning models may have, you know, let's say 10 billion parameters, but it's all matrix multiplication once it's trained. So it's actually very easy to store in a compressed way and evaluate rep very quickly. Whereas yeah. a kind of sets of decision trees are a lot of if statements and yeah. um, you potentially need to carry around all the trees with you to store the model. So how, how do they work? How do they compare with regards to storage and evaluation time in practice? Yeah. So all these um, uh, GBM implementation put a lot of effort into making things very efficient uh both from training point of view and also for prediction point of view so uh, on the so there are lots of tricks and then uh that they, they manage to so there, there is for example random forest the basic package that you get with r it's very inefficient it uses a lot of memory and uh probably like a hundred or a thousand times more memory, and it's probably like a hundred or thousand times slower than uh, the other algorithms. So uh, actually, I think you can even see it. Uh... In fairness, though, I think this one goes back to the original implementation, though. So it's it's yes, to that yes, and optimized, right? Yes, but it's they put so much effort into optimizing and even low level down to the kind of like how the data is stored. Uh, for example, to store the categorical uh, data as uh, bitmaps, and then uh, they, they go down to basically manipulating almost bits, and uh, especially on the GPU to fit on this uh, few gigabytes of data that GPUs had, uh, let's say, five years ago, they, they did all kind of tricks. Then in some of the other, uh, I think H2 is also using this kind of data compression that uh, basically, you have zeros and ones. They are instead of storing them, they, they are stored compressed, and they are like uh, in memory because the memory bandwidth was the bottleneck. So uh, there is a lot of this kind of super low um, uh, optimization, low level optimizations. Um, more specifically to your question about the uh, how the trees are stored and uh, so that the prediction or whether the prediction is fast or not. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I, I can tell you the gears, but I also have uh, this uh, repo where I looked at precisely that. The, um, so here is the this ML scoring. 
I'm comparing different the speed of uh, so basically H2 is super fast. So H2 was optimized at this fast scoring more than the others. So the others score fast if you have like a bulk, let's say you want to score a million observation, but but H2 is very fast at scoring one. And then even with large trees, like let's say a thousand trees, like gradient boosting machine or random forest, a thousand trees, depths of 10. So you would think like probably millions of splits. Uh, scoring happens in one or two milliseconds. So which is uh, pretty fast for a lot of applications. So if you throw it in your web applications, the right the the user will not perceive anything uh, slow that's faster than 100 milliseconds. And, and this is like two orders of magnitude uh, or at least one order of magnitude faster. So it's it's uh, fast enough is uh, uh, almost that, yeah, it's about the same fast as uh, UNN that uses all these matrix multiplications. So somehow they came up with a representation and uh, uh, a efficient way of calculating the prediction that it makes the predictions are, are fast. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, um, we have a relatively small live forum and we're able to go round turns. So I think we can mm -hmm. put it to a close. So um, thank you again very much for a very interesting, very compelling presentation. Thanks for swinging by. It's uh, lovely that we could uh, make this happen. And uh, I think with that, I'll conclude. Uh, hit stop on the record button and make this available then in due course. Uh, everybody's okay with that. Sounds great.